Hello, my name is Matthew Harrison. I'm a farming system scientist at the University of Tasmania in Australia. I've entitled this talk Carbon, Cash, Cattle and the Climate Crisis because those are the elements contained in the presentation. I've been invited to speak with agriculture and agri-food in Canada on rethinking the way that we model. So specifically, what was I asked to do? One of the requests was to demonstrate how we as farming system scientists or agroecological scientists should be rethinking the way uh, we conceptualise, apply and reframe our modelling frameworks. I was asked to present some of my previous work and I'll talk briefly about some of the climate change and greenhouse gas emissions people-centric work that we're doing. I was asked to provide some insights on multidisciplinary work, including integration of outputs from different models. And I was asked to um, provide some guidance and some avenues for a way forward in the way that we um, improve our model processes, uh, the application of our models, and how we can think about attribution of impact uh, from our modelling processes. So at the University of Tasmania, we do place-based research. We do place-based research for global impact. So that means that the, um, the problems and the research that we work on is locally relevant, but uh, is, is place-based, but globally relevant. So some of the projects that I'm working on uh, at the moment uh, are listed there in front of us. And broadly speaking, we aim to improve the profitability, the productivity, the sustainability and the social license or the social acceptability of agricultural systems with emphasis on cropping and livestock systems. So in, later on in this presentation, I'll talk a bit about the what's called the Nexus project. Um, the Nexus project looks at, as the name suggests, the nexus between productivity, profitability, greenhouse gas emissions under an increasingly variable climate, so with emphasis on extreme weather events which are expected to become increasingly frequent with climate change. In Australia, the red meat or the livestock sector has come up with a CN30 initiative, which means carbon neutrality for the whole of livestock sector by 2030. I lead a large project called CN30 Pathways in which we're co-designing, in which we're doing people-centric research with end users to design profitable, sustainable, productive and socially, accept, socially acceptable greenhouse gas emissions mitigation options. So that's with and for livestock producers, so it's demand driven. Um, an associated project with that is called Benefits, where we're really focused on regenerative uh, farms. So we're comparing regen ag with conventional farming practices with a specific focus on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the natural capital or the value that natural resources can give to agricultural productivity, so it's a win-win. So there's no conflict or contradiction between environmental sustainability and agricultural productivity. Another project that I lead is called Water Can Profit. Um, and typical of many past projects that we've done, it's actually developing a digital tool, a disruptive technology, um, that's with and for irrigated grains farmers. So specifically, the aim is to improve dollars per megalitre or dollars per hectare. So improve the profitability per drop of irrigation water. My team does quite a lot of work on earth observation, so satellite imagery. So merging of uh, satellite imagery, satellite imagery with advanced biophysical approaches. So we're merging temporal with spatial imagery. And so that incorporates machine learning uh, as well as fundamental processes um, programmed in a temporal sense. So one of the things that we're doing for that is, for example, using nanosatellites, Planet Labs, to try to improve um, the management of grazing systems remotely, and so therefore reduce labour costs. So fundamental to a lot of the work that we do, it's very applied. So we work a lot with the community. So it's participatory. Um, it's iterative. So what do I mean by that? We involve end users, typically the farming community, in our research from the start. So we go to them to get the problem. It's very much demand driven. Um, so we work often with farmer groups, with industry, with policy makers, um, and with the broader community really to ensure that the approaches that we conceive are relevant, are contemporary, and are, uh, and are legitimate really. So this, 
in that way, when you incorporate end users in the process, um, it increases their familiarity with the modeling processes and the decision frameworks and the digital tools that you use. It increases their confidence. Um, you can refine your modeling and the analytics that you use throughout the process to ensure that it's relevant. And in that way, it facilitates co-learning. Um, it facilitates confidence. Um, they learn about the process throughout it, but also the researchers themselves res uh, learn about how the end users conceptualize and will use the problem. So it facilitates co-learning. The end users benefit as well as the researchers really. It's very much people centric. As I said before, it circulates around the community and engagement and it's iterative. So we can go out to them um, and go out to them for example go out to the farming community for example and ask them what the problem is the problem might be climate change adaptation it might be improving soil fertility um, there might be a, a bunch of suggestions that we hear we can go away and tailor a solution for that and then come back to them in an iterative way and say well this is what we think we heard is that applicable often it's not well, often it's not entirely correct and then we revise our modeling systems and then we go back in a circle um, and repeat and re refine our modelling frameworks in an iterative way. I said at the start of the presentation that it's place-based and globally relevant. A fundamental part of the research that I lead is climate change or climate crisis adaptation and greenhouse gas emissions mitigation. Greenhouse gas emissions, we're all connected with a global atmosphere. We've only got one atmosphere. Um, if that atmosphere is polluted with greenhouse gas emissions in one place, It'll generally result in warming in another place, so it's a globally relevant problem. It's transdisciplinary, and this is part of the request that I received at the start. So often the projects that uh, uh, happen in my team include modelers, uh, computer programmers, economists, social scientists, um, and many, many other people, in, most often industry, and it crosses many boundaries. So I mentioned end user co-design, what does that really mean and what does it really look like in, a, in an agricultural context? So you've got this cycle where you plan, you act, you observe and you reflect. The planning could be anything really, but uh, um, the majority of my work has been on climate change and climate change adaptation. So we go out to farmer groups, specifically livestock, but also the grain sector ask them what they propose uh, with regards to climate adaptation. And that can be anything from soil fertility uh, to grazing management to new crop genotypes to breeze, breeding uh, to, more, to broader things, to, to things like low finance loans, to, um, uh, to landscape approaches, to community approaches. So very, very broad. We... Uh, attempt to validate the approaches that we do we and then we refine them and so the the action which is usually conducted within a re research team uh, can involve modeling can involve coding but also can be social analysis could be semi-structured interviews uh, we observe or we go back to the end users that we engaged at the start could be in, in general it's the same end users but it could be different ones as well and that's through things like workshops farm field days, meetings, and otherwise. And then we refine our and, and recalibrate our modelling approaches based on that feedback. So usually, for example, what we hear for a start and the proposed solutions that we come up with with our modelled frameworks are not generally uh, entirely 100% correct and there's a need for refinement. And that might be, for example, modelling a baseline farm system, trying to establish the number of live weight and the number of cattle sold per year or the amount of supplementary feed used. Um, we attempt to calibrate our model and then it will come up with a set number of uh, an amount of supplementary feed used per year and that might be bales of hay per year. We go back to the farming community or the farmers that we first engage and we say, is this applicable? And often they say, well, no, not, not quite. You have to refine it. And so we refine that in our modelling framework and repeat the process. And so that goes through one or two cycles. Um, the action in later cycles of um, end user co-design can be implementation on farm. So it can be implementation of a climate change adaptation or greenhouse gas emissions, or it could be the development of a new platform, a new algorithm, a new decision support tool, a new disruptive technology. And in the end, the, the aim is 
Although we might have used modeling, modeling frameworks, decision support tools, digital apps as an extension tool, in the process, the end users have actually learnt about the problem. They've actually learnt about proposed, profitable, sustainable solutions for the problem, and that's more likely to lead to adoption. In some cases, we specifically engage people who have an intent to adopt. So people are wanting the results of the research before the ink is dry on the page, so to speak. Now, I'll move a little bit on to climate change here. Now, what I've shown here is from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Um, uh, people will be familiar with charts of, of similar to this. So what this shows is mean surface temper temperature anomaly. I think it's calibrated to 1961 to 1990 based on a 30-year climatology. What you can see since about 1950, 1960, the mean surface temperature of Australia has been going up. And so since about 1980, uh, that black line there is a 10-year moving average. The average surface temperature has gone up by one degree in 40 years. And you might say, well, that's not so bad. What, what are people really worried about? One degree is not so bad. But it's not so much the gradual climate change that's the killer. And the agricultural, particularly crop modelling community, has focused traditionally on gradual climate change. But the problem, and part of the area that we haven't traditionally focused on, mainly because it's very difficult, is the climate crisis aspect. So we've had an exponential increase in the number of extreme weather events. So what this shows is the percentage of land area hitting decile 10 maximum temperature. So that means the top 10th percentile of maximum temperature. And so you can see that since about 1980, 1990, again plotting a 10 year moving average, that black line, it's gone up exponentially. That's just in terms of heat waves. So I think we really should be, as agricultural systems modelers, we should be really focused on the climate crisis with emphasis on extreme climatic or extreme weather events. Um, we haven't traditionally focused on extreme weather events, and that's because, well, first of all, their projection is very difficult, but in the, even in the absence of projecting them, their quantification is extremely difficult. We have traditionally built our agricultural systems models around ambient or around optimal conditions, around a, a photosynthetic period for photosynthetic optimally temperature range between 20 and 25 degrees. And if, if the temperature goes outside that, that given day in a crop model or a livestock systems model is typically discounted or not, not accounted for. But it's the extreme events that do the damage. It's the extreme events that wipe out large areas and that cause massive financial damage. People may be familiar with the extreme bushfires that Australia had uh, between the end of September uh, 2019 and February 2020, which are reported to have burnt more than 12 million hectares, killed more than a billion animals, and destroyed thousands of structures. And of course, after February 2020, May 2020 was the beginning of the pandemic in Australia. So it's, it's not just abiotic challenges that we all face. And then two years later, in Brisbane, which is mid-east coast of Australia and northern New South Wales, we had, this, we had these massive flooding events. So at the end of February this year, in February this year, Brisbane had nearly 700 millimetres in seven days, which is about, which is 27 inches, which is the largest seven-day seven total of rainfall ever recorded. And the cost, which is still rising as insurance claims come in, is reported to be about $4.3 billion. So why would we focus on gradual climate change when it's the singular extreme events? And it might not necessarily be bushfires or flooding in a model. It might be heat waves or drought or cascading events uh, that we really need to focus on. What we did here um, was attempt to include extreme events in our modelling. Now, don't worry too much about the detail. What I've shown is, is seasonal pasture growth rates. So each one of these box plots shows a distribution of pasture growth rates for a given month. And so they're, they're a run of 30 or 40 years of simulations. It's at three different sites, but don't worry too much about that. What I've shown is the historical climate or the climatology. I've shown a low emission scenario, not accounting for extreme events. I've shown a high emission scenario accounting for extreme events. Um, and I've show, shown the, the same thing, sorry, with, um, with a high emission scenario. 
and just have a look at the colours there and relate the colours to the box plot. Probably the main thing to note is both the median of production, the median of growth rates has gone down, but the variability has gone up. So this is just accounting for droughts and heat waves. So if we accounted for other extreme events, uh, extreme winds for example, in our systems models, which we traditionally haven't done because mainly because we're focused on the main things or perhaps because it's been more difficult, we'd pro probably see that the productivity estimates that we've come up with would be overestimated and the variability perhaps would be higher. We've actually published that. Um, that's in a agricultural systems journal uh, publication. There was one in 2016, but I also think there was one in 2017. Now, after seeing those pictures of the bushfires and flooding, you might um, be somewhat depressed. Um, it's important to note that um, scientists really should have a duty to promote positive opportunities as well. Uh, of course, scientists have to be agnostic. We have to promote uh, and demonstrate the results as they are, um, without bias or without favouritism. But on climate change, um, because it's a very topical issue, we, we also need to look for um, and promote the positive opportunities associated with climate change. Otherwise, consumer and public confidence might dwindle and we wouldn't want despair to set in. Uh, in a Nature Food article I talked about, despite the climate there, I talked about the positive effects of climate change on US dairy production. US dairy or the northern parts of the US traditionally exposed to extreme cold events, uh, being under snow for six months of the year. Uh, and the publication uh, perspective piece, I talked about a recent publication in Nature Food, which actually showed that the sensitivity of US dairy production to extreme colds had gone down, in part due to improvements in management, in breeding, in animal breeding, but also pasture breeding and technology, as well as the interaction between them. Farming systems are complex businesses. We really need um, our models to account for interaction, appropriate interaction between management, between climate, between genetics, animal and pastures and technology. Another positive response associated with the climate crisis or with climate change is potentially melting of permafrost. So if you've got, if you've got a warming climate and you've got exposed areas of permafrost that's recently melted, you've got exposed potentially ar arable areas of agricultural landscapes. But the question is, how well equipped are our existing models to account for it? We, we recently published an article in Grasslands Research and that was led by Daniel Forster at, um, at Luke in Finland and that looked at it, how well equipped our existing agroecological models are for simulating not just productivity of grasslands but also greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, if, you, if you're exposing large swaths of land that have previously been under ice, there's large potential for potentially uh, warming of the soils and loss of organic matter and therefore loss of carbon and therefore increased global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so now I'll change the focus back to some of our participatory work and some of the work that we're currently doing with case study farmers. Um, it comes back to that project that I mentioned at the start of the presentation which was called the Nexus project. Uh, we've got a number of different case study farms and this is um, not only the University of Tasmania but it's in collaboration with the University of Melbourne and CSIRO and we have a number of real case study farms so they range from sheep farms at the top of Queensland uh, down to beef farms at the top of Queensland rather down to sheep farms in the Midlands of Tasmania and so that's a distance to give you an idea of about 2,500 kilometres so it's a significant distance and as you can imagine, we've got a significant difference in those landscapes. So the northern Queensland farm is typical rangelands. It's very low productivity relative to the other farms. And they really only have two seasons. They really only have the wet season and the dry season. And our models need to be... Uh, the first thing that our models need to be equipped for is seasons, is climate. And I mean, that's the real value that they have, is integrating and using and translating climatic effects into biological and biophysical effects. The farm in Gippsland there is, looks somewhat different, rolling green hills, and the northern Tasmanian farm, I think the cattle probably have a better view than many people in Australia in terms of real estate. So it's some um, cool temperate maritime environment there with about uh, 1,000 to 1, 1 1.2 metres of rainfall a year.
the process that we're using there, we're, we're looking at, you, we've got a regional reference group of farmers and industry experts, and they're informing us of the future climate challenges, the climate change adaptations that we're looking at. We've projected future climate impacts at each of these sites in those case study zones that I just showed you. Um, we're looking at historical, we're looking at 2050, 2030 and 2050 climate horizons. And we're imposing those climates on the baseline farm systems and then we're extrapolating from those baseline farm systems to co-design adaptations to future climate change and then refining them with the regional ref reference group. We're also looking at transformational adaptations. Now transformational as a term is probably hackneyed or overused these days, um, but transformational uh, nonetheless, we are proposing to look at combining uh, beneficial elements of all of the other adaptations, not just biophysical but financial and social, to come up with these transformational adaptations. We're looking at a number of different metrics, so we're looking at product productivity, profitability, adaptation, mitigation and social licence. And as I said before, it's very iterative. So we come up with an initial estimate for the modelling, but also the preliminary social research. Then we go back to the disciplinary experts and say, this is what we think we heard you say. Is it right? And then we refine it or recalibrate the models from there. So in that way, they learn about the process and the propensity for adoption is much higher. We're also doing on-farm uh, demonstration, so we're piloting some of the emergent greenhouse gas emissions mitigation interventions um, and we're demonstrating that through field days and really I mean the the modeling looks at productivity and greenhouse gas emissions but there's all of the, all sorts of other aspects that are not accounted for in a model because a model is a simplification of reality and so the farmer or the farmer groups can talk about the practical aspects of the on-farm experiments that's not accounted for in the modeling and in that way We've got extension and communication with industry, so that's our avenue for not only impact and adoption, but scaling. So one thing that we're testing as part of that on-farm demonstration that's come out of the modelling is biochar. So pyrolyzed wood product um, heated to seven or 900 degrees in the absence of oxygen uh, comes up with this charcoal-like product. Uh, we're feeding it to animals out in the field. We're actually we're going to cover it up soon um, because the animals we've noticed are less likely to eat it when it's wet. But that's by the by. What what we're actually proposing uh, is that um, there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that biochar reduces enteric methane, and that because it increases the surface area of the rumen, you improve live weight gain. And it's undigestible, so it passes through the animal in the manure and goes through to soil carbon. And then it actually enhances the dung beetle ecology, or well, at least there's evidence to suggest there is. We haven't observed that as yet, but the dung beetles are said to incorporate that dung and the biochar into the soil through back black channel tunnels down into the soil, and you can actually see 30 centimetres down the dung beetles are driving that biochar down to the soil. So you're impacting enteric methane, you're impacting live weight gain, you're impacting uh, soil carbon. So really we're looking at that in a modelling framework, and this is where again models come into their own, to look at multiple aspects. We're looking at productivity, so emissions intensity, gross and net greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking at multiple metrics and we're using multiple models. So we're simulating herd and livestock productivity with grass grow, um, and that simulates pasture production and supplementary feed very well, and that's got ruminant biology in it, ruminant being the cattle and the sheep. We're simulating soil organic carbon with another model called Roth C, which is the Rothamsted uh, soil organic carbon model. We're simulating and calculating net greenhouse gas emissions and counting for enteric methane, manure methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide in another model called SBGAF. And we're simulating trees and forestry in another model, and that's, that also accounts for land use change. FullCam, by the way, is the Australian government. It's accepted model for uh, soil carbon and for trees in Australia. In terms of economics, we're using a stochastic approach called at-risk, and that's a little uh, add-in in, um, in Excel. That's how we're doing the economic analysis. And we've got a number of different uh, approaches and, and methodologies for the social analysis. So that's discourse analysis. We're using semi-structured interviews. And there's also a model called ADOPT, uh, 
uh, which focuses primarily on social aspects. And now, uh, what we're really doing in, in many of the projects that I lead is stacking. Now, stacking is a fancy way of saying combining greenhouse gas emissions mitigation options or combining climate change interventions. Some people refer to it as contextualised bundles of greenhouse gas emissions mitigation options. It doesn't really matter whichever way you do it, but it really means can we combine beneficial elements as long as they're not deleterious to each other? Can we combine them so that we get a, an additive or potentially multiplicative effect in terms of not just emissions mitigation, but productivity and profitability? So based on feedback from farmer groups, we co-designed four different mitigation themes. We have this low-hanging fruit theme, which is simple, immediate, reversible changes. Um, some, not all of them uh, are reversible, but generally they are. So they, some of those included improving soil fertility or raising pH by adding lime, um, higher animal feed conversion efficiency or a moderate increase, which is what we've seen historically, incorporating deep-rooted legumes, which might be lucerne or alfalfa. Um, the other adaptation was towards carbon neutral. Now, the aim of that was to reduce year-on-year -year greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we've actually stacked that on top of the low-hanging fruit adaptation. So we've imposed carbon sequestration plus greenhouse gas emissions avoidance mitigation options. And that's things like, some of those things are a little bit more futuristic, like enteric methane, um, it, like a vaccine for enteric methane inhibition. Uh, income diversification. So if, you're, if you've got a climate that's progressively uh, being coming up with more extreme events, such as drought and heat waves, how do we buffer your income, which is pro primarily based on agricultural commodities, for example, pasture or crop production, how do we buffer that income such that you derive income from a different source, for example, carbon and biodiversity? And we've got the transformational modelling. Now, that is really designed to transform our farming systems, first of all, to how that climate window looks in 2030 and 2050. So the transformational systems that we model are contextualised. So the transformational systems that we model in northern Queensland are very different to those that we model in Tasmania. So they're long-term, high-risk adaptations. So I'll just talk a bit about, well, I'll just have one slide here on greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is actual farm results for the sheep farm in Tasmania. So the y-axis there is thousands of tonnes of CO2 equivalents per hectare, thousands of tonnes of CO2 per year. So that's for the historical period, where the historical period was from the start of 1980 to the end of 2018. So we've got um, a total farm greenhouse gas emissions of about 7,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalents, a net greenhouse gas emissions, so that take away the sequestration from carbon and uh, vegetation and you get about 4,600. When you simulate that current baseline system in 2050, you actually see that greenhouse gas emissions increase slightly uh, from 7,000 to 7,100. But probably the main thing is that carbon sequestration has gone from 34% under the historical climate down to 18% under the future climate. So what that suggests, in the absence of practice change, so this is assuming uh, that the farm system is exactly how it operates historically, which it probably wouldn't be, but for the purpose of modelling, we're assuming it was, carbon sequestration will decline. Um, now, that message, um, which I've promoted generally, hasn't gone down that well with the uh, with some, of, some people in the agricultural community, but um, as I said before earlier in the presentation, we have to be agnostic. That was the result, and there's a fundamental reason for that. That's because... Um, warmer soils hold less organic matter and respiration increases and you lose more CO2. So then we've got the LHF option, which is the low hanging fruit. So that's the current farm system um, in 2050. And you can see that greenhouse gas emissions increase slightly. So they've gone up to 7,700 gross greenhouse gas emissions. And that's because productivity increased slightly. So coming back to that positive message of climate change, which I mentioned at the start, um, you've got a cold climate in Tasmania in winter. You've got elevated CO2, which has a CO2 carbon dioxide fertilisation effect, so that improves growth. So your growth 
total in Tasmania, not necessarily in Queensland, has increased. So that's a positive message in itself. What I've shown here, the TCN one, is the total gross emissions of our of everything stacked together. So that's trees, that's planting legumes, that's with um, all of the interventions improved feed conversion efficiency combined. And you can see that farm emissions have gone up to 8,700. So what that indicates that underpins the fundamental linkage between higher productivity and higher greenhouse gas emissions. And decoupling that linkage has been a fundamental and very recalcitrant challenge of uh, not just system scientists, but scientists in general for a long time. So decoupling that linkage between productivity and emissions will be a game changer. And so that's partially what we're doing in, Nexus, in the Nexus project, um, but also the wider portfolio of research that I lead. And so you can see that uh, there's a 22 or about a 20% increase in greenhouse gas emissions of that TCN relative to the baseline under the 2050 climate. Now the next three bars, what I'm going to show is I'm actually disaggregating the individual components of the TCN to show their effect on net greenhouse gas emissions. That's the green component. So what I've shown here is lucerne. So what's the effect of lucerne, i.e. a deeper rooted legume on deep soil carbon? So if you're planting a, a pasture that grows roots deeper than the existing root base, the hypothesis would be that you improve soil carbon to a deeper level. So we tested that in a system sense, so you're planting different paddocks, you're accounting for growth, you're accounting for different climates, you're accounting for grazing. And what we found is that the impact of soil carbon associated with deeper rooted legumes, realistically deeper rooted legumes in a, in a very good soil, which is a ferrosol, was low. So it's only about 3%. In contrast, we also modelled the effect of what an enteric methane inhibition vaccine would be. So people talk about vaccines. So a vaccine is like a needle that you give to your animals perhaps once a year. I'm unaware that um, enteric methane inhibition vaccines are currently available, but I do know that there's research going on on them. So what we can do as system scientists is we can test the value proposition of proposed reductionist or disciplinary re disciplinary research. So that's what we did. We used the figure from published research of the anticipated effect of enteric methane inhibition in our systems models. We then scale that up to the whole farm level, assume that all animals are vaccinated once a year, assume the regular growth rates of the animals, the climate inputs that they're that they're exposed to, well they're exposed to the climates but they're allowed to eat grass and um, uh, consume supplementary feed and all sorts of other things that they do in a typical farm setting and we found a 28% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions so a significant increase relative to the proposed mitigation effect of soil carbon. We also looked at trees and we found a 17% reduction so and you might say well that depends on the area of trees Again, we're contextualising it to the case study farm. Of course, we had different results for the different case study farms. I'm only talking about the Tasmanian one here. But what we actually showed is that thickening an area of 200 hectares, and this farmer had a large area of native trees, if we thickened them with endemic trees to the region and shrubs, you had a 17% reduction in enteric methane. So when you stack all those together, the soil carbon, the enteric methane inhibition vaccine, the trees, you have nearly a 50% reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions. So stacking, in a way, can be transformational. So you might come back and say, well, can we only focus on the main parts? Because planting lucerne would have a cost, and that's a very valid thought process, and you could potentially propose taking out lucerne and focusing on other more radical emissions mitigation interventions. Now I've only got two more parts to talk about. So the first part is the effect is the ability of models, of systems models, biophysical models to inform greenhouse gas emissions state and, and federal policy. And the other part is the extent to which we focused on one metric versus many metrics in our modelling. So Australia in late 2021 reduced, introduced, not reduced, a new soil carbon policy. Um, the the name of the framework un under which that fits in Australia is called, or used to be called, the Emissions Reduction Fund. I think it's called the Climate Solutions Fund now. That's a hybrid-based approach. That uses both measurement, 
because measurement's expensive, and modelling. And the modelling is based on full cam, which I mentioned before. Now, all new activities must demonstrate additionality. So what is additionality? Additionality means that you've got your baseline farm system as it operates today. You come along with an intervention, you apply more nutrients or you undertake new irrigation to an area and you have to demonstrate that in the, with that inter intervention your carbon, whether it's soil carbon or carbon in vegetation, has increased relative to what it would have been. Because if you don't have that additionality rule in there, the increase in carbon, whether it's soil carbon or vegetation, would have happened anyway. So you're paying farmers for something that would have happened anyway. So that's, that's the policy perspective. But on the other hand, I hear a lot from farmers. I had a farmer in Central Australia saying to me the other day, uh, additionality makes the good farmers bad and the bad farmers good. And what she meant by that was that if you have historically had good management practices and built your soil carbon up to the maximum that it can be, might be 4 or 5 or 6%, then you go to enrol in the uh, soil carbon policy, you haven't got really anywhere to go because it's at its maximum level. So the potential to gain under additionality is quite low. So in contrast, if you've degraded your land, if you've got a bare soil surface, if it's overgrazed and your soil carbon is, is low for a start, and then you enrol in a soil carbon policy, you've potentially got a large amount to gain, you've potentially got a large amount to build your soil carbon up, because historically it hasn't been managed that well. And so some of the f leading farmers that I've been talking to are saying that they should be paid to retain their carbon. And in a way, that's almost like reverse additionality, because if you didn't pay them, that soil carbon could go down. So that's something to consider. Um, in using models, uh, establishing a cred credible baseline period is critical. So any change in carbon, particularly soil carbon, is usually measured relative to that baseline. So a one-year period is usually not applicable, particularly you know, if it was in a bad period. Usually you're wanting a three- or a five-year baseline period and then measuring the change in carbon relative to that baseline period. And, and I was heartened to see that the federal government are now proposing an integrated farm management method, or really a policy, that actually allows combination or stacking of different emissions mitigation policies on the one area, which traditionally you couldn't do. So you might, you might um, enrol in a soil carbon sequestration policy, you might also enrol in a uh, reforestation one, you might... Re you might um, enrol in what Australia has another one called avoided deforestation if you were going to log an area of trees. So you can combine all those on what's called the same carbon estimation area. And that's due to be released in early 2023. So that's very pleasing to see, not just because it's significantly uh, used as a holistic modelling framework, but it proposes stacking emissions mitigation interventions. We talk about that at length in creating frameworks to foster soil carbon sequestration. We not only talk about the evolution of Australia's policies, emissions mitigation policies, but we also talk about fundamental management practices and technologies to improve soil carbon as well as the key drivers. But we also talk about wider economic, social, environmental and cultural aspects impacting soil carbon sequestration. And that's a useful segue into my final point, which is about carbon myopia. What do I mean by carbon myopia? I mean that fundamental and reductionist research has focused on one metric, greenhouse gas emissions or enteric methane or nitrous oxide. And that's fine, that's because that's where most research starts with an individual skill, technology, practice or whatever it may be and then measure the effect of that intervention on greenhouse gas emissions. But what that leads to is what I call carbon myopia. We tend to overlook the co-benefits and trade-offs associated with the greenhouse gas emissions mitigation intervention. So to give you an example, we might propose feeding asparagopsis or red algae to um, cattle uh, to, and that, that can have a transformational effect on enteric methane. I've seen some reports that it really leads to 80 or 90 percent reduction in enteric methane. But what we often overlook or what we look at second or third is the effect of that asparagopsis or that livestock feed supplement on livestock productivity. So if it actually improved livestock productivity, it would improve profitability. 
And so what we've shown in our past research is that the producer or the farmer is much more likely to adopt a greenhouse gas emissions intervention if it has a co-benefit, particularly if it improves productivity. And we've shown that soil carbon, for example, well, not so much soil carbon, but livestock feed supplements at an Australian carbon price of $20 a tonne, bearing in mind that it's uh, two to three times as much as that now, the value of productivity is an order of magnitude or 10 times as much as the value of the carbon. But the carbon, as the carbon price goes up, that will change rapidly. Other co-benefits, for example, improving soil carbon might be improving drought resilience, might be improving water hole capacity, improving the services ecosystems give in terms of agricultural productivity. But you can also have trade-offs. So if you're going to change your farm system, it usually has a cost. Farmers won't usually do things for nothing. They won't do things for societal gain unless they're, for example, um, uh, communitarians. They'll usually do it if there's a payback because it's a business, it's their livelihood, it's their prosperity. Um, you might have a trade-off to animal welfare. You might have pollution swapping. What do I mean by pollution swapping? You might improve soil carbon. Improved soil carbon may improve fertility and improve pasture production. And if your pasture increases, would you necessarily keep your stocking rate, your number of animals per hectare the same? Possibly not. The farmer would probably increase the stocking rate to consume that additional feed. And if you've increased your stocking rate, you've increased your enteric methane or the methane coming out their mouth and therefore the, the increased enteric methane has offset the reduction in carbon from CO2. So you've got what's called pollution swapping. So you really need a holistic systems framework that accounts for all greenhouse gas emissions so that if one goes down you can account for the other one that goes up. So I think future research really needs to move beyond this myopic lens on carbon and also consider the wider economic, environmental, social and cultural implications of an intervention. Now, of course, no one study can look at all aspects in any given study, simply because they haven't got the labour, they haven't got the time, haven't got the capability. All I'm saying is that instead of doing a, a study on the individual effects of greenhouse gas emissions, talk in the discussion of a paper or in your study, consider cost, consider supply chains, consider what the environmental effects, even if it's not a direct part of the study. Scientists have a duty to talk about these aspects in the publication, at least to guide future research where it should be looking at. And as I said before, co-benefits and trade-offs are much more likely to influence adoption particularly at current carbon prices at least in Australia anyway they're much higher in Europe um, because it's you know farmers will do things for impact for generally for profitability and productivity um, we're wanting societal gain the green the global atmosphere is connected as one uh, and we're wanting individual land users which is their individual prosperity for them to change they need significant stimulus and we talk about that in detail in a an article published in 2021 in global change biology where we talk about carbon myopia and the need for a, a wider look at some of the social environmental and economic implications associated with greenhouse gas emissions mitigation interventions we also talk about projected growth in greenhouse gas emissions in future so just to sum up and this is my final slide where to from here so I think modelers uh, and agro ecosystems modelers are really ideally placed to conduct people centric research. We use the model as a framework, the model as a proxy, if you like, to go away to uh, as an analytical framework to analyse what's been suggested to us by end users, be it farmers or policy makers, to go away and test it and to come back to them and refine it in an iterative way. And I think that is key to impact. Um, when talking about climate change, I think climate change research, development and extension and adoption should shift away from gradual climate change, which we've done for a long time, simply because it's, um, um, it's generally the first thing that people look at towards extremes, which are more difficult, but they're going to cause a lot more, a, a lot greater effect, although are less frequent, but can cause a lot greater detrimental effect compared with gradual climate change in terms of productivity and profitability. Consider co-benefits and trade-offs associated with greenhouse gas emissions uh, or mitigation interventions, and that's really 
you could impose an intervention or an adaptation strategy and that could be maladaptive. Uh, it could result in, again, in one area being maladaptive uh, in another area. Move beyond the myopic lens on carbon. So consider wider economic, environmental, social and cultural implications of an intervention or at least think about it and talk about it in the discussion or provide guidance to others um, about an important area uh, to build on current greenhouse gas emissions mitigation research and that might be the cost of an intervention. And I think um, in ca to come back to the brief, uh, what does transdisciplinary work really require? It requires more coordination. It requires breakdown of jargon. A social scientist might necess not necessarily use the same terminology as a biophysical scientist, so even though they're talking about the same thing. Um, but it can lead to more holistic solutions. It requires more planning, uh, generally more meetings, more refinement. But I think because you're coming at a proposed problem, be it climate crisis adaptation or greenhouse gas emissions mitigation from a many different dimensions, it can result in improved sustainability and gener generally greater prosperity in the long term. So that's all I wanted to say for today. Uh, if anyone if, is, has stuck with the presentation this long, thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to um, Agri-Food and Agriculture Canada for the invitation to present. I've really enjoyed it. If anyone wants further information, there's my email there. I've got a few links to my staff profile as well as my research gate profile. So. Thanks very much and I hope to hear from you soon.